Less than a fortnight later, we left the last hint of polar land behind us and thanked heaven that we were clear of a haunted, accursed realm where life and death, space and time have made black and blasphemous alliances in the unknown epochs since matter first writhed and swam on the planet's scarce-cooled crust. Since our return, we have all constantly worked to discourage Antarctic exploration and have kept certain doubts and guesses to ourselves with splendid unity and faithfulness. Even young Danforth, with his nervous breakdown, has not flinched or babbled to his doctors. Indeed, as I have said, there is one thing he thinks he alone saw which he will not tell even me, though I think it would help his psychological state if he would consent to do so. It might explain and relieve much, though perhaps the thing was no more than the delusive aftermath of an earlier shock. That is the impression I gather after those rare, irresponsible moments when he whispers disjointed things to me, things which he repudiates vehemently as soon as he gets a grip on himself again. It will be hard work deterring others from the great white south, and some of our efforts may directly harm our cause by drawing inquiring notice. We might have known from the first that human curiosity is undying, and that the results we announced would be enough to spur others ahead on the same age-long pursuit of the unknown. Lake's reports of those biological monstrosities had aroused naturalists and paleontologists to the highest pitch. Though we were sensible enough not to show the detached parts we had taken from the actual buried specimens, or our photographs of those specimens as they were found, we also refrained from showing the more puzzling of the scarred bones and greenish soapstones, while Danforth and I have closely guarded the pictures we took or drew on the super plateau across the range, and the crumpled things we smoothed, studied in terror, and brought away in our pockets. But now that Starkweather Moor party is organizing, and with a thoroughness far beyond anything our outfit attempted. If not dissuaded, they will get to the innermost nucleus of the Antarctic and melt and bore till they bring up that which may end the world we know. So I must break through all reticences at last, even about that ultimate nameless thing beyond the mountains of madness. 4. It is only with vast hesitancy and repugnance that I let my mind go back to Lake's camp and what we really found there and to that other thing beyond the frightful mountain wall. I am constantly tempted to shirk the details and to let hints stand for actual facts and ineluctable deductions. I hope I have said enough already to let me glide briefly over the rest, the rest, that is, of the horror at the camp. I have told of the wind-ravaged terrain, the damaged shelters, the disarranged machinery, the various uneasinesses of our dogs, the missing sledges and other items, the deaths of men and dogs, the absence of Gedney, and the six insanely buried biological specimens, strangely sound in texture for all their structural injuries, from a world forty million years dead. I do not recall whether I mentioned that upon checking up the canine bodies, we found one dog missing. We did not think much about it till later. Indeed, only Danforth and I have thought of it at all. The principal things I have been keeping back relate to the bodies, and to certain subtle points which may or may not lend a hideous and incredible kind of rationale to the apparent chaos. At the time I tried to keep the men's minds off those points, for it was so much simpler, so much more normal, to lay everything to an outbreak of madness on the part of some of Lake's party. From the look of things, that demon mountain wind must have been enough to drive any man mad in the midst of this center of all earthly mystery and desolation. The crowning abnormality, of course, was the condition of the bodies, men and dogs alike. They had all been in some terrible kind of conflict, and were torn and mangled in fiendish and altogether inexplicable ways. Death, so far as we could judge, had in each case come from strangulation or laceration. The dogs had evidently started the trouble, for the state of their ill-built corral bore witness to its forcible breakage from within. It had been set some distance from the camp because of the hatred of the animals for those hellish Archean organisms, but the precaution seemed to have been taken in vain. When left alone in that monstrous wind behind flimsy walls of insufficient height, they must have stampeded, whether from the wind itself or from some subtle increasing odor emitted by the nightmare specimens, one could not say. Those specimens, of course, had been covered with a tent cloth, yet the low Antarctic sun had beat steadily upon that cloth, 
and Lake had mentioned that solar heat tended to make the strangely sound and tough tissues of the things relax and expand. Perhaps the wind had whipped the cloth from over them and jostled them about in such a way that their more pungent olfactory qualities became manifest despite their unbelievable antiquity. But whatever had happened, it was hideous and revolting enough. Perhaps I had better put squeamishness aside and tell the worst at last, though with a categorical statement of opinion, based on the first-hand observations and most rigid deductions of both Danforth and myself, that the then-missing Gedney was in no way responsible for the loathsome horrors we found. I have said that the bodies were frightfully mangled. Now I must add that some were incised and subtracted from in the most curious, cold-blooded and inhuman fashion. It was the same with dogs and men. All the healthier, fatter bodies, quadrupedal or bipedal, had had their most solid masses of tissue cut out and removed, as by a careful butcher, and around them was a strange sprinkling of salt, taken from the ravaged provision chests on the plains, which conjured up the most horrible associations. The thing had occurred in one of the crude aeroplane shelters from which the plane had been dragged out, and subsequent winds had effaced all tracks which could have supplied any plausible theory. Scattered bits of clothing roughly slashed from the human incision subjects hinted no clues. It is useless to bring up the half-impression of certain faint snow prints in one shielded corner of the ruined enclosure, because that impression did not concern human prints at all, but was clearly mixed up with all the talk of fossil prints which poor Lake had been giving throughout the preceding weeks. One had to be careful of one's imagination in the lee of those overshadowing mountains of madness. As I have indicated, Gedney and one dog turned out to be missing in the end. When we came on that terrible shelter, we had missed two dogs and two men, but the fairly unharmed dissecting tent which we entered after investigating the monstrous graves had something to reveal. It was not as Lake had left it, for the covered parts of the primal monstrosity had been removed from the improvised table. Indeed, we had already realized that one of the six imperfect and insanely buried things we had found, the one with the trace of a peculiarly hateful odor, must represent the collected sections of the entity which Lake had tried to analyze. On and around that laboratory table were strewn other things, and it did not take long for us to guess that those things were the carefully though oddly and inexpertly dissected parts of one man and one dog. I shall spare the feelings of survivors by omitting mention of the man's identity. Lake's anatomical instruments were missing, but there were evidences of their careful cleansing. The gasoline stove was also gone, though around it we found a curious litter of matches. We buried the human parts beside the other ten men, and the canine parts with the other thirty-five dogs. Concerning the bizarre smudges on the laboratory table, and on the jumble of roughly handled illustrated books scattered near it, we were much too bewildered to speculate. This formed the worst of the camp horror, but other things were equally perplexing. The disappearance of Gedney, the one dog, the eight uninjured biological specimens, the three sledges and certain instruments, illustrated technical and scientific books, writing materials, electric torches and batteries, food and fuel, heating apparatus, spare tents, fur suits and the like, was utterly beyond sane conjecture, as were likewise the spatter-fringed ink blots on certain pieces of paper and the evidences of curious alien fumbling and experimentation around the planes and all other mechanical devices, both at the camp and at the boring. The dog seemed to abhor this oddly disordered machinery. Then, too, there was the upsetting of the larder, the disappearance of certain staples, and the jarringly comical heap of tin cans pried open in the most unlikely ways and at the most unlikely places. The profusion of scattered matches, intact, broken, or spent, formed another minor enigma, as did the two or three tent cloths and fur suits which we found lying about with peculiar and unorthodox slashings, conceivably due to clumsy efforts at unimaginable adaptations. The maltreatment of the human and canine bodies, and the crazy burial of the damaged Archean specimens, were all of a piece with this apparent disintegrative madness. In view of just such an eventuality as the present one, we carefully photographed all the main evidences of insane disorder at the camp, and shall use the prints to buttress our pleas against the departure of the proposed Starkweather Moor expedition. 
Our first act after finding the bodies in the shelter was to photograph and open the row of insane graves with the five-pointed snow mounds. We could not help noticing the resemblance of these monstrous mounds with their clusters of grouped dots to Poor Lake's description of the strange greenish soapstones. And when we came on some of the soapstones themselves in the great mineral pile, we found the likeness very close indeed. The whole general formation, it must be made clear, seemed abominably suggestive of the starfish head of the Archean entities, and we agreed that the suggestion must have worked potently upon the sensitized minds of Lake's overwrought party. Our own first sight of the actual buried entities formed a horrible moment, and sent the imaginations of Pobody and myself back to some of the shocking primal myths we had read and heard. We all agreed that the mere sight and continued presence of the things must have cooperated with the oppressive polar solitude and demon mountain wind in driving Lake's party mad. For madness, centering in Gedney as the only possible surviving agent, was the explanation spontaneously adopted by everybody so far as spoken utterance was concerned. Though I will not be so naive as to deny that each of us may have harbored wild guesses which sanity forbade him to formulate completely. Sherman, Pobody, and McTighe made an exhaustive aeroplane cruise over all the surrounding territory in the afternoon, sweeping the horizon with field glasses in quest of Gedney and of the various missing things, but nothing came to light. The party reported that the Titan barrier range extended endlessly to right and left alike, without any diminution in height or essential structure. On some of the peaks, though, the regular cube and rampart formations were bolder and plainer, having doubly fantastic similitudes to Rorik painted Asian hill ruins. The distribution of cryptical cave mouths on the black snow denuded summits seemed roughly even as far as the range could be traced. In spite of all the prevailing horrors, we were left with enough sheer scientific zeal and adventurousness to wonder about the unknown realm beyond those mysterious mountains. As our guarded messages stated, we rested at midnight after our day of terror and bafflement, but not without a tentative plan for one or more range-crossing altitude flights in a lightened plane with aerial camera and geologist's outfit beginning the following morning. It was decided that Danforth and I try it first, and we awaked at 7 a.m., intending an early trip, though heavy winds, mentioned in our brief bulletin to the outside world, delayed our start till nearly 9 o'clock. I have already repeated the non-committal story we told the men at camp and relayed outside after our return sixteen hours later. It is now my terrible duty to amplify this account by filling in the merciful blanks with hints of what we really saw in the hidden transmountain world, hints of the revelations which have finally driven Danforth to a nervous collapse. I wish he would add a really frank word about the thing which he thinks he alone saw, even though it was probably a nervous delusion, and which was perhaps the last straw that put him where he is, but he is firm against that. All I can do is to repeat his later disjointed whispers about what set him shrieking as the plane soared back through the wind-tortured mountain pass after that real and tangible shock which I shared. This will form my last word. If the plain signs of surviving elder horrors in what I disclose be not enough to keep others from meddling with the inner Antarctic, or at least from prying too deeply beneath the surface of that ultimate waste of forbidden secrets and unhuman, eon-cursed desolation, the responsibility for unnameable and perhaps immensurable evils will not be mine. Danforth and I, studying the notes made by Pobody in his afternoon flight and checking up with a sextant, had calculated that the lowest available pass in the range lay somewhat to the right of us, within sight of camp, and about 23,000 or 24,000 feet above sea level. For this point, then, we first headed in the lightened plain as we embarked on our flight of discovery. The camp itself, on foothills which sprang from a high continental plateau, was some 12,000 feet in altitude. Hence the actual height increase necessary was not so vast as it might seem. Nevertheless, we were acutely conscious of the rarefied air and intense cold as we rose, for on account of visibility conditions we had to leave the cabin windows open. We were dressed, of course, in our heaviest furs. As we drew near the forbidding peaks, dark and sinister above the line of crevasse-riven snow and interstitial glaciers, we noticed more and more the curiously regular formations clinging to the slopes, and thought again of the strange Asian paintings of Nicholas Rurik. 
The ancient and wind-weathered rock strata fully verified all of Lake's bulletins and proved that these hoary pinnacles had been towering up in exactly the same way since a surprisingly early time in Earth's history, perhaps over fifty million years. How much higher they had once been, it was futile to guess, but everything about this strange region pointed to obscure atmospheric influences unfavorable to change and calculated to retard the usual climatic processes of rock disintegration but it was the mountainside tangle of regular cubes, ramparts, and cave mouths which fascinated and disturbed us most. I studied them with a field glass and took aerial photographs while Stanforth drove, and at times relieved him at the controls, though my aviation knowledge was purely an amateur's, in order to let him use the binoculars. We could easily see that much of the material of the things was a lightish Archean quartzite, unlike any formation visible over broad areas of the general surface, and that their regularity was extreme and uncanny to an extent which poor Lake had scarcely hinted. As he had said, their edges were crumbled and rounded from untold eons of savage weathering, but their preternatural solidity and tough material had saved them from obliteration. Many parts, especially those closest to the slopes, seemed identical in substance with the surrounding rock surface. The whole arrangement looked like the ruins of Machu Picchu in the Andes, or the primal foundation walls of Kish, as dug up by the Oxford Field Museum expedition in 1929, and both Danforth and I obtained that occasional impression of separate Cyclopean blocks, which Lake had attributed to his flight companion Carol. How to account for such things in this place was frankly beyond me, and I felt queerly humbled as a geologist. Igneous formations often have strange regularities, like the famous Giant's Causeway in Ireland, but this stupendous range, despite Lake's original suspicion of smoking cones, was above all else non-volcanic in evident structure. The curious cave mouths near which the odd formations seemed most abundant presented another, albeit a lesser puzzle, because of their regularity of outline. They were, as Lake's bulletin had said, often approximately square or semicircular, as if the natural orifices had been shaped to greater symmetry by some magic hand. Their numerousness and wide distribution were remarkable and suggested that the whole region was honeycombed with tunnels dissolved out of limestone strata. Such glimpses as we secured did not extend far within the caverns, but we saw that they were apparently clear of stalactites and stalagmites. Outside, those parts of the mountain slopes adjoining the apertures seemed invariably smooth and regular and Danforth thought that the slight cracks and pittings of the weathering tended toward unusual patterns. Filled as he was with the horrors and strangenesses discovered at the camp, he hinted that the pittings vaguely resembled those baffling groups of dots sprinkled over the primeval greenish soapstones so hideously duplicated on the madly conceived snow mounds above those six buried monstrosities. We had risen gradually in flying over the higher foothills and along toward the relatively low pass we had selected. As we advanced, we occasionally looked down at the snow and ice of the land route, wondering whether we could have attempted the trip with the simpler equipment of earlier days. Somewhat to our surprise, we saw that the terrain was far from difficult as such things go, and that despite the crevasses and other bad spots, it would not have been likely to deter the sledges of a Scott, a Shackleton, or an Amundsen. Some of the glaciers appeared to lead up to wind-bared passes with unusual continuity, and upon reaching our chosen pass, we found that its case formed no exception. Our sensations of tense expectancy as we prepared to round the crest and peer out over an untrodden world can hardly be described on paper, even though we had no cause to think the regions beyond the range essentially different from those already seen and traversed. The touch of evil mystery in these barrier mountains and in the beckoning sea of opalescent sky glimpsed betwixt their summits was a highly subtle and attenuated matter not to be explained in literal words. Rather was it an affair of vague psychological symbolism and aesthetic association, a thing mixed up with exotic poetry and paintings and with archaic myths lurking in shunned and forbidden volumes. Even the wind's burden held a peculiar strain of conscious malignity and for a second it seemed that the composite sound included a bizarre musical whistling or piping over a wide range as the blast swept in and out of the omnipresent and resonant cave mouths. There was a cloudy note of reminiscent repulsion in this sound, as complex and unplaceable as any of the other dark impressions. 
We were now, after a slow ascent, at a height of 23,570 feet, according to the aneroid, and had left the region of clinging snow definitely below us. Up here were only dark, bare rock slopes and the start of rough-ribbed glaciers, but with those provocative cubes, ramparts, and echoing cave mouths to add a portent of the unnatural, the fantastic, and the dreamlike. Looking along the line of high peaks, I thought I could see the one mentioned by Poor Lake, with the rampart exactly on top. It seemed to be half lost in a queer Antarctic haze, such a haze, perhaps, as had been responsible for Lake's early notion of volcanism. The pass loomed directly before us, smooth and windswept between its jagged and malignly frowning pylons. Beyond it was a sky fretted with swirling vapors and lighted by the low polar sun, the sky of that mysterious, farther realm upon which we felt no human eye had ever gazed. A few more feet of altitude and we would behold that realm, Danforth and I, unable to speak except in shouts amidst the howling, piping wind that raced through the pass and added to the noise off the unmuffled engines, exchanged eloquent glances. And then, having gained those last few feet, we did indeed stare across the momentous divide and over the unsampled secrets of an elder and utterly alien earth. Five. I think that both of us simultaneously cried out in mixed awe, wonder, terror, and disbelief in our own senses as we finally cleared the pass and saw what lay beyond. Of course, we must have had some natural theory in the back of our heads to steady our faculties for the moment. Probably we thought of such things as the grotesquely weathered stones of the Garden of the Gods in Colorado or the fantastically symmetrical wind-carved rocks of the Arizona desert. Perhaps we even half thought the sight a mirage like that we had seen the morning before on first approaching those mountains of madness. We must have had some such normal notions to fall back upon as our eyes swept that limitless, tempest-scarred plateau and grasped the almost endless labyrinth of colossal, regular, and geometrically eurythmic stone masses which reared their crumbled and pitted crests above a glacial sheet not more than forty or fifty feet deep at its thickest, and in places obviously thinner. The effect of the monstrous sight was indescribable, for some fiendish violation of known natural law seemed certain at the outset. Here, on a hellishly ancient tableland fully twenty thousand feet high, and in a climate deadly to habitation since a pre-human age not less than five hundred thousand years ago, there stretched nearly to the vision's limit a tangle of orderly stone which only the desperation of mental self-defense could possibly attribute to any but a conscious and artificial cause. We had previously dismissed, so far as serious thought was concerned, any theory that the cubes and ramparts of the mountainsides were other than natural in origin. How could they be otherwise, when man himself could scarcely have been differentiated from the great apes at the time when this region succumbed to the present unbroken reign of glacial death? Yet now the sway of reason seemed irrefutably shaken, for this cyclopean maze of squared, curved, and angled blocks had features which cut off all comfortable refuge. It was, very clearly, the blasphemous city of the mirage and stark, objective, and ineluctable reality. That damnable portent had had a material basis after all. There had been some horizontal stratum of ice dust in the upper air, and this shocking stone survival had projected its image across the mountains according to the simple laws of reflection. Of course, the phantom had been twisted and exaggerated, and had contained things which the real source did not contain. Yet now, as we saw that real source, we thought it even more hideous and menacing than its distant image. End of Side 6 To continue, change side selector switch and turn the cassette over. Side 7 Tales of H.P. Lovecraft by H.P. Lovecraft Continuing with At the Mountains of Madness on page 171 Only the incredible, unhuman massiveness of these vast stone towers and ramparts had saved the frightful thing from utter annihilation in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years it had brooded there amidst the blasts of a bleak upland. Corona Mundi, roof of the world, 
All sorts of fantastic praises sprang to our lips as we looked dizzily down at the unbelievable spectacle. I thought again of the eldritch primal myths that had so persistently haunted me since my first sight of this dread Antarctic world, of the demoniac plateau of Leng, of the Mi-Go or abominable snowmen of the Himalayas, of the necotic manuscripts with their pre-human implications, of the Thulu cult, of the Necronomicon, and of the Hyperborean legends of formless Sathagua and the worse than formless star spawn associated with that semi-entity. For boundless miles in every direction the thing stretched off with very little thinning. Indeed, as our eyes followed it to the right and left along the base of the low, gradual foothills which separated it from the actual mountain rim, we decided that we could see no thinning at all, except for an interruption at the left of the pass through which we had come. We had merely struck at random a limited part of something of incalculable extent. The foothills were more sparsely sprinkled with grotesque stone structures linking the terrible city to the already familiar cubes and ramparts which evidently formed its mountain outposts. These latter, as well as the queer cave mouths, were as thick on the inner as on the outer sides of the mountains. The nameless stone labyrinth consisted for the most part of walls from ten to one hundred fifty feet in ice-clear height, and of a thickness varying from five to ten feet. It was composed mostly of prodigious blocks of dark primordial slate, schist, and sandstone, blocks in many cases as large as four by six by eight feet, though in several places it seemed to be carved out of a solid, uneven bedrock of Precambrian slate. The buildings were far from equal in size, there being innumerable honeycomb arrangements of enormous extent, as well as smaller, separate structures. The general shape of these things tended to be conical, pyramidal, or terraced. Though there were many perfect cylinders, perfect cubes, clusters of cubes, and other rectangular forms, and a peculiar sprinkling of angled edifices whose five-pointed ground plan roughly suggested modern fortifications. The builders had made constant and expert use of the principle of the arch, and domes had probably existed in the city's heyday. The whole tangle was monstrously weathered, and the glacial surface from which the towers projected was strewn with fallen blocks and immemorial debris. Where the glaciation was transparent, we could see the lower parts of the gigantic piles, and notice the ice-preserved stone bridges which connected the different towers at varying distances above the ground. On the exposed walls we could detect the scarred places where other and higher bridges of the same sort had existed. Closer inspection revealed countless largish windows, some of which were closed with shutters of a petrified material originally wood, though most gaped open in a sinister and menacing fashion. Many of the ruins, of course, were roofless and with uneven though wind-rounded upper edges, whilst others of a more sharply conical or pyramidal model, or else protected by higher surrounding structures, preserved intact outlines despite the omnipresent crumbling and pitting. With the field glass we could barely make out what seemed to be sculptural decorations in horizontal bands, decorations including those curious groups of dots whose presence on the ancient soapstones now assumed a vastly larger significance. In many places the buildings were totally ruined and the ice sheet deeply riven from various geologic causes. In other places the stonework was worn down to the very level of the glaciation. One broad swath, extending from the plateau's interior to a cleft in the foothills about a mile to the left of the pass we had traversed, was wholly free from buildings and probably represented, we concluded, the course of some great river which in tertiary times, millions of years ago, had poured through the city and into some prodigious subterranean abyss of the Great Barrier Range. Certainly this was above all a region of caves, gulfs, and underground secrets beyond human penetration. Looking back to our sensations and recalling our dazedness at viewing this monstrous survival from eons we had thought pre-human, I can only wonder that we preserved the semblance of equilibrium which we did. Of course, we knew that something, chronology, scientific theory, or our own consciousness was woefully awry, yet we kept enough poise to guide the plane observe many things quite minutely, and take a careful series of photographs which may yet serve both us and the world in good stead. In my case, ingrained scientific habit may have helped, for above all my bewilderment and sense of menace there burned a dominant curiosity to fathom more of this age-old secret, 
to know what sort of beings had built and lived in this incalculably gigantic place, and what relation to the general world of its time, or of other times, so unique a concentration of life could have had. For this place could be no ordinary city. It must have formed the primary nucleus and center of some archaic and unbelievable chapter of Earth's history, whose outward ramifications, recalled only dimly in the most obscure and distorted myths, had vanished utterly amidst the chaos of terrene convulsions, long before any human race we know had shambled out of apedom. Here sprawled a Paleogean megalopolis, compared with which the fabled Atlantis and Lemuria, Camorium and Uzolderum and Olathoe and the land of Lomar are recent things of today, not even of yesterday, a megalopolis ranking with such whispered pre-human blasphemies as Volusia, Rilia, Ib in the land of Mnar, and the nameless city of Arabia Deserta. As we flew above that tangle of stark titan towers, my imagination sometimes escaped all bounds and roved aimlessly in realms of fantastic associations, even weaving links betwixt this lost world and some of my own wildest dreams concerning the mad horror at the camp. The plane's fuel tank, in the interest of greater lightness, had been only partly filled, hence we now had to exert caution in our explorations. Even so, however, we covered an enormous extent of ground, or rather air, after swooping down to a level where the wind became virtually negligible. There seemed to be no limit to the mountain range, or to the length of the frightful stone city which bordered its inner foothills. Fifty miles of flight in each direction showed no major change in the labyrinth of rock and masonry that clawed up corpse-like through the eternal ice. There were, though, some highly absorbing diversifications, such as the carvings on the canyon where that broad river at once pierced the foothills and approached its sinking place in the Great Range. The headlands at the stream's entrance had been boldly carved into cyclopean pylons, and something about the ridgy, barrel-shaped designs stirred up oddly vague, hateful, and confusing semi-remembrances in both Danforth and me. We also came upon several star-shaped open spaces, evidently public squares, and noted various undulations in the terrain. Where a sharp hill rose, it was generally hollowed out into some sort of rambling stone edifice, but there were at least two exceptions. Of these latter, one was too badly weathered to disclose what had been on the jutting eminence, while the other still bore a fantastic, conical monument carved out of the solid rock and roughly resembling such things as the well-known snake tomb in the ancient valley of Petra. Flying inland from the mountains, we discovered that the city was not of infinite width, even though its length along the foothills seemed endless. After about thirty miles the grotesque stone buildings began to thin out, and in ten more miles we came to an unbroken waste virtually without signs of sentient artifice. The course of the river beyond the city seemed marked by a broad, depressed line, while the land assumed a somewhat greater ruggedness, seeming to slope slightly upward as it receded in the mist-hazed west. So far we had made no landing, yet to leave the plateau without an attempt at entering some of the monstrous structures would have been inconceivable. Accordingly, we decided to find a smooth place on the foothills near our navigable pass, there grounding the plain and preparing to do some exploration on foot. Though these gradual slopes were partly covered with a scattering of ruins, low flying soon disclosed an ample number of possible landing places. Selecting that nearest to the pass, since our next flight would be across the Great Range and back to camp, we succeeded about 12.30 p.m. in coming down on a smooth, hard snowfield, wholly devoid of obstacles and well adapted to a swift and favorable takeoff later on. It did not seem necessary to protect the plane with a snow banking for so brief a time and in so comfortable an absence of high winds at this level. Hence we merely saw that the landing skis were safely lodged and that the vital parts of the mechanism were guarded against the cold. For our foot journey we discarded the heaviest of our flying furs and took with us a small outfit consisting of pocket compass, hand camera, light provisions, voluminous notebooks of paper, geologist's hammer and chisel, specimen bags, coil of climbing rope, and powerful electric torches with extra batteries, this equipment having been carried in the plane on the chance that we might be able to effect a landing, take ground pictures, make drawings and topographical sketches, and obtain rock specimens from some bare slope, outcropping, or mountain cave. 
Fortunately, we had a supply of extra paper to tear up, place in a spare specimen bag, and use on the ancient principle of hare and hounds for marking our course in any interior mazes we might be able to penetrate. This had been brought in case we found some cave system with air quiet enough to allow such a rapid and easy method in place of the usual rock-chipping method of trailblazing. Walking cautiously downhill over the crusted snow toward the stupendous stone labyrinth that loomed against the opalescent west, we felt almost as keen a sense of imminent marvels as we had felt on approaching the unfathomed mountain pass four hours previously. True, we had become visually familiar with the incredible secret concealed by the barrier peaks, yet the prospect of actually entering primordial walls reared by conscious beings perhaps millions of years ago, before any known race of men could have existed, was none the less awesome and potentially terrible in its implications of cosmic abnormality. Though the thinness of the air at this prodigious altitude made exertion somewhat more difficult than usual, both Danforth and I found ourselves bearing up very well, and felt equal to almost any task which might fall to our lot. It took only a few steps to bring us to a shapeless ruin worn level with the snow, while ten or fifteen rods farther on there was a huge, roofless rampart still complete in its gigantic five-pointed outline, and rising to an irregular height of ten or eleven feet. For this ladder we headed, and when at last we were able actually to touch its weathered cyclopean blocks, we felt that we had established an unprecedented and almost blasphemous link with forgotten eons normally closed to our species. This rampart, shaped like a star and perhaps three hundred feet from point to point, was built of Jurassic sandstone blocks of a regular size, averaging six by eight feet in surface. There was a row of arched loopholes or windows about four feet wide and five feet high, spaced quite symmetrically along the points of the star and at its inner angles, and with the bottoms about four feet from the glaciated surface. Looking through these, we could see that the masonry was fully five feet thick, that there were no partitions remaining within, and that there were traces of banded carvings or bas-reliefs on the interior walls, facts we had indeed guessed before when flying low over this rampart and others like it. The lower parts must have originally existed. All traces of such things were now wholly obscured by the deep layer of ice and snow at this point. We crawled through one of the windows and vainly tried to decipher the nearly effaced mural designs, but did not attempt to disturb the glaciated floor. Our orientation flights had indicated that many buildings in the city proper were less ice-choked, and that we might perhaps find wholly clear interiors leading down to the true ground level if we entered those structures still roofed at the top. Before we left the rampart, we photographed it carefully and studied its mortarless cyclopean masonry with complete bewilderment. We wished that Pobody were present, for his engineering knowledge might have helped us guess how such titanic blocks could have been handled in that unbelievably remote age when the city and its outskirts were built up. The half-mile walk downhill to the actual city, with the upper wind shrieking vainly and savagely through the skyward peaks in the background, was something whose smallest details will always remain engraved on my mind. Only in fantastic nightmares could any human beings but Danforth and me conceive such optical effects. Between us and the churning vapors of the west lay that monstrous tangle of dark stone towers, its outre and incredible forms impressing us afresh at every new angle of vision. It was a mirage in solid stone, and were it not for the photographs, I would still doubt that such a thing could be. The general type of masonry was identical with that of the rampart we had examined, but the extravagant shapes which this masonry took in its urban manifestations were past all description. Even the pictures illustrate only one or two phases of its infinite bizarrery, endless variety, preternatural massiveness, and utterly alien exoticism. There were geometrical forms for which an Euclid could scarcely find a name, cones of all degrees of irregularity and truncation, terraces of every sort of provocative disproportion, shafts with odd bulbous enlargements, broken columns in curious groups, and five-pointed or five-ridged arrangements of mad grotesqueness. As we drew nearer, we could see beneath certain transparent parts of the ice sheet and detect some of the tubular stone bridges that connected the crazily sprinkled structures at various heights. Of orderly streets there seemed to be none, 
the only broad open swath being a mile to the left, where the ancient river had doubtless flowed through the town into the mountains. Our field glasses showed the external horizontal bands of nearly effaced sculptures and dot groups to be very prevalent, and we could half imagine what the city must once have looked like, even though most of the roofs and tower tops had necessarily perished. As a whole, it had been a complex tangle of twisted lanes and alleys, all of them deep canyons, and some little better than tunnels because of the overhanging masonry or overarching bridges. Now, outspread below us, it loomed like a dream fantasy against a westward mist through whose northern end the low, reddish Antarctic sun of early afternoon was struggling to shine. And when for a moment that sun encountered a denser obstruction and plunged the scene into temporary shadow, the effect was subtly menacing in a way I can never hope to depict.